so before we begin, we need to understand, you know, what is the context of APIs and why are we doing this? As everyone knows, today it is uh, inconceivable to think of uh, any uh, app which doesn't use APIs. So you may be developing even a desktop app and you may think that a desktop app is a standalone app. But even though it's a standalone app, it is likely that it is making API calls to uh, some uh, endpoint in the network, in the cloud somewhere. Or it could be using certain open source components within the application. So your uh, core of the application or the business logic of the application is making API calls to those uh, dependent uh, modules or packages which you are using in your app. So whether the API is a network app, API accessible on the web or it is internal to the app, it hardly matters. What is important to bear in mind is that today we hardly develop apps without using APIs. Somewhere or other, we will be using APIs within our app. So that's uh, you know uh, the importance of APIs. But APIs have become all the more important recently. Uh, re when I say recently, I would I would say in the last 20 years, where more and more pro projects are open source projects. So I even though I may be developing a commercial app, I may be calling certain open source projects out there, which have exposed certain APIs to their uh, projects or packages. So with the rise of open source projects, plus the rise of cloud computing, uh, in particular, the use of microservices, uh, APIs have become all the more important. Why microservices comes into this discussion, you may be wondering. The answer is simple. Previously, let's say 20 years back, people were designing monolithic applications. That means the entire code base is compiled and delivered as a single binary. You download it and install it, and then you execute that binary. Today, apps are uh, built in a disaggregated fashion. Apps is an app is composed of multiple parts, and each part may be installed independently, and each part talks to another part using APIs. So each part will be deployed in the cloud as a microservice, and one microservice will call another microservice as required using APIs. So that is why APIs have also become all the more important because a lot of apps are mo moving away from the monolithic architecture to microservice architecture. So that is another reason why APIs are extremely important in today's context. Okay, we have understood this broad uh, you know, landscape why APIs are important, but where does open API specification come in? So to start with the general point I want to make is it is perfectly possible to design an application without using open API specification. So I develop an app, I publish the APIs for the app and others can call that app using those APIs. How do they do that? How do they know what to call, how to call, what parameters to pass, what kind of responses can be expected? All that should be properly documented. So there is no requirement for me or anybody else or any developer to follow open API specification because any API will do. You can design your API in any way you want. The only important thing is you have to document it properly. If it is properly documented, then people who are calling your API know exactly how to call it and how to interpret the results. So this is the way people have been doing API programming for a long time through proper documentation and following the documentation. But then a open API gives us a better way. So what does it bring us? Open API defines basically rules, syntax and semantics for defining or describing a RESTful API. So think of it this way. I will give you an analogy of uh, Devopedia itself. Let's go to any uh, particular article on Wikipedia. So this is an article on Wikipedia. I'm just using it as an analogy. So the article has a certain structure. As you notice, it has a title. It has some sort of a summary on top. Then it has a table of contents. And in this particular article, there are 10 uh, headings. And each heading, it is organized as paragraphs. Some headings, it is organized. There is just a table. In some places, it is a list. This one is a list and so on. 
But this structure in Wikipedia is, is not fixed in any way. If you go to some other article, suppose I go to another article, API Blueprint. Okay, so this is the external link. That is not what we wanted. Suppose I go to representational state transfer. So this is an internal Wikipedia article. Now we go to another article. You see the structure is quite different. There are some common things. There is a title here. There is some summary, but now you see summary has become very long in this article and summary includes a list. Then the table of contents is very vast. Again, there are 10 points, but then there is a sub list. Subheaders under, you know, header number five, subheaders under seven. And the names are also very different. Etymology, history. So there is some sort of structure, but it is not, uh, you know, a common structure. This article is very different from another article on Wikipedia. That is where uh, Devopedia is different. Every article has the same structure. You, we have a summary, we have a discussion, we have milestones, references, further reading, article stats, cite us. If you go to some other article, application programming interface, you will see exactly the same structure. Summary, discussion, milestones, references, further reading, article stats, cite us. And under discussion, everything is organized as a QA. There is a question, there is an answer. There is a question, there is an answer. So if you go to our previous article, the same structure is there. Open API specification. Same structure is followed for every article. And there are some certain benefits in following a uniform structure for all articles. We'll not get into that, but this is a kind of an analogy that I wanted to share with you. So basically, this is what Open API specification does. It provides developers and API de designers a set of rules, syntax and semantics for describing an API. And by and if everyone follows the syntax and semantics, there are certain advantages that can be gathered. So what are those advantages? So just look at this figure, for example. You can do testing, you can do implementation of the API, you can do mocking, which is also like testing. Uh, it is useful for prototyping uh, your app. You can do runtime deployment as well as runtime uh, operations. You can document your API. Uh, there are certain advantages to designing the API this way. You can share the API with multiple teams in your company or outside your company. It becomes easier to evolve and maintain the API. There are a lot of advantages to following open API specification. So why, how is this made possible? Just by following this, how is it possible that we can do all these things in a simpler way and in a more efficient way? It is possible because open API specification, it's readable both by humans as well as machines. When we say machines, meaning that programs can read the specification easily. And that is because it is specified in two formats. Either it's in a JSON format or it's in a uh, YAML format, YAML. So there are already a lot of parsers out there commonly available in almost every language which can read a YAML file or a JSON file. And once it, the specification becomes machine readable, there are a lot of things you can do once you, you get the specification into a program. So that is what happens with uh, a machine readable specification. Many tools already exist in the market which can automatically validate your API specification. It can automatically implement the specification. You can test the specification. You can mock it. You can document the APIs. Okay. So now let me give an example. Uh, some of you uh, are developers. So how will you uh, typically developers? They like to do coding, right? Yeah. Meaning that uh, they will uh, they will go to their favorite language, whether it is C sharp or uh, JavaScript or Python. And they will uh, uh, they are given a task implement this app. So they will start with coding. And some of you remember those who of you who come from the database background. What is the first thing people do in databases? Anyone can answer this. Suppose you are asked to design an app and uh, you know the app stores a lot of data. What is the first thing you do? You have to uh, search it or filter it will get the data 
from our uh, by throw api and use it no there is no api you are designing the app from scratch what is the first thing you will do you know it's a data oriented app mm -hmm. so the first thing you will do is identify the entities correct because entities translate to tables and you will start mm -hmm. by making a relational database because it gives you a big picture what they call you start with data first you create a data model correct correct so you identify the entities people do something like entity relationship diagram er diagrams they call it so they know how one table is related to another table what are the relations and after doing this like this is how people used to do 20 years back even now it is a common uh, approach the next thing they do is something called crud you guys have heard of crud yes so the full form of crud is c r u d create read update delete so basically once you have created your uh, you have identified what goes into your database the next thing is write all the models in code so that is where this crud kind of tools emerged where you give a database tables and their relationships as the input and it can automatically generate the code for making the models so you, there will be some code to read from the database table code to uh, update the table and so on so people come up with this crud uh, uh, kind of uh, methodology to quickly implement their code but this is purely a database oriented approach where you start with a data model and quickly you uh, come up with the model code using certain tools which support crud but in a api kind of an approach uh, uh, this is not how people do it okay so what people do is what they do is what we call as the api first approach rather than the traditional code first approach in the code first approach you may start with a database and then you start writing code which will read and update the database without even defining what the api is but in the api first approach which is more or less the modern way of doing things we don't care about the code at all we start with the apis first so the idea is define your apis properly define what you want from the application how people are going to use the api what kind of services they are expecting so everything starts with the api so that's what why they call this api first approach nobody writes code either it is client code or server code people focus exclusively on the api and after completing this api let's say api has matured to a certain level it need not be 100% frozen it has matured to a certain level then people can write the code but even here there is a trick because now we are following open api specification you don't have to manually write the code this is the one of the beauties of open api specification remember we said that there are many machine readable uh, there are many tools which can read the specification so some of these tools what it can do it can read the api specification and automatically generate the client and server code for you right so this is the beauty of api first approach and the beauty of open api specification remember that open api specification is more than just a data model it is not a data model like your uh, database it's not like uh, specifying the schema in mysql it's much more than that along with the data model open api specification also specifies the behavior that is to say what kind of endpoints is your api going to expose what kind of operations you can perform on each of those endpoints so we'll get to an example to clarify all this but because os goes beyond the data model it is data plus the behavior tools can make use of that and automatically create these kind of things client and server code can be generated automatically documentation can be created automatically you don't have to you know document from the code you remember in every language whether it's php or javascript or python they have cert or ruby they have concept called doc string anyone heard of doc string so doc Oops. string uh, even even now it is co very uh, uh, common doc string is when you write a function or a class at the top of the function or the class you give some uh, comments 
which is in a written in a certain format. What is the advantage of doing this? Later on, these comments can be translated to documentation. So that was the beauty of uh, that is still the beauty of these kind of doc strings, which are supported by almost every language today. So there the philosophy is you write the code first from the code using doc strings, you can generate the documentation. That was the earlier approach. Even today, that approach is uh, useful in certain cases. But when you are taking the API first approach, you don't have to care so much about doc strings because you start with the API and from the API, you direct the documentation directly. You uh, create the documentation directly. In fact, you also create the code directly. And this also indirectly means that when you evolve the API, you can also evolve quickly both the documentation as well as any code that you have written. Validation. So errors in your API design can be caught during the design phase itself, rather than waiting much later during kind of environment. People used to implement the code, then it goes to integration, then it goes to like full system level or end to end testing. So at that point, they may catch some bug and they may find that, okay, there's a problem in our initial design. So all that can be avoided because problems can be caught much earlier at the time when you are actually designing your APIs. So that is another beauty of API first approach to uh, designing an app. The other advantages of OpenAIs is it's completely open. You don't have to pay any licensing fee. It is released under Apache 2.0 licensing, which is an open license. And it has wide industry support, more than 40 members, mostly industry uh, players, companies are part of this open API initiative. And this initiative itself is under the stewardship of uh, the Linux Foundation. So that means you can be sure that, uh, you know, uh, following the open API standard is actually a good thing. And it's got good documentation and good uh, community support. So this is a brief overview of what open API can uh, uh, give us. Uh, and we covered the main benefits of open API. Now let's look at some of the uh, a little brief history of uh, open API. Some of you might have heard the term Swagger. Swagger was an API specification language which was started in 2011. So the guy who invented is his Tony Tam. So he uh, started work on this in 2010 and uh, the first version was released in 2011. The purpose is same. It is the same as open API specification the way we look at it today. But the beginning was in the beginning it was called Swagger 1.0. And in 2014 uh, a, a update was released Swagger 2.0. And in 2015, something uh, interesting happened. Uh, the Swagger specification, not the company, the specification was acquired by another company called Smart Bear, which is heavily invested in the API ecosystem. But so, uh, this particular company did not want to keep it a closed system. So towards end of that year, they opened it up. So they joined along with few other companies and they formed the open API initiative, which we have already covered. It is under the Linux foundation. And uh, a month later, that means in December, the Swagger specification, which this company acquired from uh, you know the earlier company, this was donated to the foundation, to the initiative. So the idea was to standardize API uh, design uh, using a new specification. So this all this happened in 2015. So they took about a year and a half. And in July 2017, they came up with a new version of the specification, Open API 3.0. So you may hear in the industry, Open API specification and Swagger specification, they are one and the same. In uh, earlier releases, this was called Swagger 2.0, but afterwards from 3.0, Onwards, it is called the open API specification. So don't be confused. They are one and the same, but Swagger as a specification no longer exists. So what we have to do is the open API specification. The company is still there. 
So they have a lot of other products, but Swagger as a company doesn't use Swagger 2.0 because this is like obsolete, outdated. Swagger as a company is in their internal products, they will be using only open specification 3.0. In fact, many people in who are working with Swagger, they are also contributing to the open API specification. So it makes sense that their products are also using uh, you know, OAS. So this is only historical. Whatever you see here, Swagger specification 1.0 and 2.0, that has only historical relevance. It is not used today. Maybe there are some legacy products which are still using today. That may be okay. But if you are starting a new product, new app, it is best that you follow the latest specification. In fact, the latest one is from last year, open specific, open API specification 3.1.0. So this is what uh, you know you should be using if you are starting a new uh, uh, app, or let's say you are migrating from an old uh, API to a new API. So this is the version that you should be following. And annually, you know, the initiative also organizes API specification conference, which happens uh, at different venues. So the first of these conferences was organized in 2019. This year also there is one. So there was one, uh, I think due to COVID, they had a couple of online conferences. This year they have an in-person conference. So those of you interested, you can follow that as well. So that's about a brief history of uh, open API specification. So I know it's still too early for questions, but any questions at this point? No, it's uh, going good. Uh, no problem. OK, thanks for that. So let's continue. Now we'll get into a specific example. So there is a Swagger editor, which is commonly used by any uh, designers. So don't worry about all these things that you see on the left. There are actually a lot of things here going on. Let's not worry about that. But we'll get it get into it step by step. So uh, the example we are going to talk about is what we call as a pet store. So this is an example already available on Swagger website. So I thought uh, instead of coming up with my own example, why not uh, reuse this example? So the basic idea uh, of this pet store. I mean, the, uh, sometime your voice is person? breaking. Okay, okay. Uh, any people can hear me? Yes, yes. Is it clear? Okay, can... maybe some local thing. Yeah. So, uh, Pet Store, uh, it's an app, obviously, and uh, it's an online kind of a e shop where uh, people can browse what is available on the store and order. And exactly what they are selling, they are selling uh, pets. It can be cats, dogs, or maybe more exotic pets like snakes. I don't know. So all sorts of uh, pets are sold via an online store. Now, if you are an uh, app designer, how would you start defining, uh, you know, uh, the entities or the APIs or whatever it is? How would you start designing this app? So we already covered this. We said that, OK, let's do an API first uh, approach, but it is not exactly clear exactly which where would you start so this is where your design comes comes into play uh, i mean design thinking is uh, in design thinking you may call it user stories that is one of the name people use another name uh, used by uh, developers uh, who are from a technical background a, uh, you can also call it as a behavior driven development so some of you might have heard this term BDD, Behavior De Driven Development. That also relates to what we are going to talk about today. So in, in either of these cases, design thinking or BDD, uh, you start with the user story. So when I say user story, uh, let me open up an editor to make it easier for us to visualize. So I am a user. 
let's say I want to buy, I came across this app. I want to buy a uh, pet or adopt a pet. So I come to this website and what is the first thing I see or first thing I do? I browse a list of pets which are on sale, right? So browsing. So basically this is a list of pets on sale, let's assume. And uh, obviously uh, my store has lots of pets. Maybe I have, uh, you know, thousands of pets on sale and I cannot list all the all the pets on a single page. So then there is something called paginate paginate. So as a user, again, we are looking at a user story. What a user will do once he or she comes to that website. So user will start browsing. He or she does, doesn't like what they see on the first page. They will go to the next page, next page, previous page and so on. So they are navigating through pagination. That means you have a long list of bits and you paginate from one. Then, you know, the user gets interested in one particular pet. So they would like to view the details of the pet, right? Details of a particular, particular item or a pet. So this is one of the things that you will do when you view a particular pet. Beyond pagination, what else as a user I can do? So I would like to know, for example, uh, you know, uh, other than drawing and pagination, I will do some filtering. So this is one of the things I will do uh, as a user. Maybe I am a dog person. I don't like uh, cats or I don't like any other type of pets uh, in my house. I, I want only dogs filter by type. Even within a dog, maybe uh, there are certain species of dogs I don't want. I want a particular type of dog, maybe a Labrador. So then I will say particular species. I want to filter by a particular species by age. So lots of things I can do to filter. So this is another operation that I may do on the when I am browsing. Another thing I may want to do is. Uh, I may want to filter, let's say by typing a string. Maybe not by type or because this these kind of things suggest that I am filtering by a certain drop down box or something, but I can type something, uh, let's say Labrador. So by typing a string also, I can do filtering. What else can I do? I can do sorting. Maybe there is some sort of a sorting mechanism I will need. For example, sort by price, sort by ratings. Maybe I want all the five stars to be on top. I want Lowest price, you know, sorting I can apply. So we are looking at the app purely from a user perspective. So this is what we call as a user story. But the story is not over here. After we have done this, we have to start looking at other things. So let's say I looked at the details of the pet, but as now we think about the whole app from a designer's perspective. So when we are the details, what kind of details you think? So many of these things are covered here. So you can have a type, you can have species, you can have age or date of birth, and uh, previous where the pet was born or how it came into this uh, store. So those kind of things can be there. Price can be there. Photo of the pet can be there, right? So these are what you would call details of the pet. So now this kind of thing relates to the uh, database. So you can uh, think of a pet being a particular table in the database and that table will have these kind of attributes. So that is how it will actually translate to an implementation later on. But let's continue with the user story. User has viewed all these details. Now the user decides that I want to buy. Right, I want to buy a particular pet. So that is where another user's. So now before buying a pet, you have to do a few things. What, what do you need to do? Add to cart. Add 
happening the cart is not enough you can you have to give your details those kind of details and uh, payment so another so to complete the transaction payment so what kind of things you need for payment what are the options you are making available for the customer so payments could be things like uh, credit card debit card so now we are actually flushing out details of the app this is how an app actually develops right now having understood that let's go back and see how this translates to api design now we are going to go into the app proper so all the user stories that we did identifying you know what kind of interactions happen in the app they all translate to a high level view of the api like this i hope you can see it i'll increase the font okay so now you see what open api calls as paths are nothing but api endpoints in the language of let's say restful api these are all endpoints and how do we come up with these endpoints we come up with these endpoints by going through these user stories but these are the things that our app requires and from here we got some idea we will have a pet entity we will have a customer entity we will probably have an order entity to process so this basically translates to what we see here in the api endpoints you can see here there are a number of endpoints which start with slash pet then there are some endpoints which start with slash store within the store there is a sub endpoint inventory that is what is there currently in the store what has already been ordered so that is also classified under the store uh, api endpoint and a particular order then you have another endpoint under the category of under the root path of slash user so there you have a number of things going on create with list login log out so obviously before the user orders the pet or makes payment he is required to log in log out and you can also fetch details of a particular user what do we have for pet so you have a top level uh, endpoint here then you can find a pet by status find a pet by tags find a pet by uh, pet id and then upload an image so you have a pet id you can upload an image of the pet so at a high level you know the user stories we started with translates to api endpoints which are organized in this manner now let us expand one of these if you expand the pet you will see a few things happening we know that restful api has certain verbs or what we call as http methods put post so now we see that these operations or so called http methods are organized under each of these endpoints that we have defined at high level so let's do this for other endpoints also just to get an idea what is going on so you can see here we'll do this only for pets for the moment so you can see here at a high level find by status find by tags it makes sense this is that means already pets are there in our online store we are trying to find by status what is what are all the pets which are available by tags what are the pets which are available okay but suppose you want to let's open this post i'm minimizing the details so we'll get to the details later now i am looking at post right so we are at the endpoint slash pet and within this endpoint we are using the http method called post and look at the description and a summary of this add a new pet to the store so let's say a new pet has come in to the center and i want to add it to the online store then i will call this particular endpoint slash pet using the post method to add that to the online store and when i do call this api i will use a certain request body which contains probably details of the pet and then 
I expect a certain re response that the pet was added correctly to the uh, system. So uh, this is the post. That means you are adding a new pet to the store. After adding, let's say the user is browsing on the website for all the pets. So then user would do something like this. Find by status. Get. Right. So this is what we saw he here earlier filtering. You are trying to list all pets which match a certain type or a species or age. So this is exactly what is happening here. So we are exposing two endpoints, find by status, find by tax. You can create any number of endpoints, but these are all get operations on the endpoint. So suppose somebody does a post operation on this endpoint, we know straight away that the, the API request is going to fail because the API clearly defines on this particular endpoint only get is allowed. Whereas on this endpoint post is allowed, put is allowed. So you see at a high level, you can define your APIs without even writing any, any code. All you are doing is right, defining your API simply in YAML. So we are here following a YAML format, but you can also do this in JSON. So we are doing a get operation. Let's assume that, you know, uh, in this case, there is a delete operation. Pet, pet ID. So let's take one step at a time. Remember, there is something we did here. When the user likes a particular pet, they will do a view operation. But to do a view operation, you have to give a particular pet. And the pet is identified, every pet is identified by a unique identifier. That is exactly what is happening here. In this particular endpoint, you not only give slash pet, but you also give the identifier pet ID. And when you give the pet ID, you will get full details about the pet. Right? Full details. So you can see here schema, it refers to pet. So you get full details about the pet. And now with the question you may ask, from where did I get the pet ID? You got the pet ID when you are browsing for all the pets or when you are paginating to the next page. Each page, when, when it is listed, there the pet ID will also be available so that a view end call can be made. So this you can find if you look at this particular thing here. So this gives a certain uh, response and this takes you to some schema called pet, which we will see shortly. And this will contain the identifier. So this identifier goes back to the client as a response. And in that response, you will get the pet ID. So the next call that you make to get de full details of a, of a particular pet, you can do so using this particular endpoint, pet, pet ID. So that is the get operation. Post, what is the post operation? You want to update a pet in the store for various reasons. Suppose uh, uh, by mistake you gave the wrong piece or the wrong date of birth. So you want to update that or a certain status changed. So you want to update that. So this is post operation. And you want reason. Maybe when the pet is sold, you want to delete it or somebody screwed up, they made a wrong entry to the database. So in which case you want to delete that entry in the database. So whatever reason, you should support a delete operation. So that is also part of this endpoint. Okay. Now the similar thing, similar story is happening here for users, for stores, and all these are similar. So as a summary, I want to conclude here saying that what we have done, we have identified the app at a high level, which translated to endpoints, API endpoints like this. And for each endpoint, we identified what are the supported methods. And you go down deeper into each of the methods and you say for each method, what are the parameters I should support? When you call that method, what is the kind of response that should be given? And in some cases, there will be a request body as well. 
So we saw here when you do a post, there is a request body. So a content which contains all the details of the pet is also posted. So this would be the request body. Now the question is, we never saw this. What is the pet? Right? Where are the details of this pet? So this is again one of the beauties of open uh, API specification. It allows you to reuse definitions. So if you go down here, there is something called components at the bottom. If you open this, you have something called schemas. And in this schemas, order, customer, address, category, user, tag, pet, all these things are defined. Now we don't define in every endpoint these things. What we define is we use, we make all these definitions in this common place called schemas and then refer that here. Everywhere we need it, we refer it. So this makes the definition of a pet reusable across the entire API specification. Now in code, all this you can imagine, each of this will translate to a model. So remember earlier we talked about CRUD, where you define the databases, you define your entity relationship, and then you use CRUD to generate the implement models in code. In API first approach, it is exactly opposite. You define your API first, you don't bother about uh, either the code or how it translates to data databases. You define your API first, and from here, there are tools to automatically generate the code for you. So now I will pause for questions. Um, Which one I you recommend? Uh, go ahead, Rajan Nagendra. Which one you recommend API first or in a uh, uh, YAML? Uh, what is that? Code first. Code first. Uh, code first, yeah. Yeah. Which one you recommend? So I large... recommend the API, API first approach because everything is driven by API these days. And this also ties in with uh, agile methodology where you want to release a minimum viable product quickly to your customer and quickly gather feedback. So the point is that everything should be consumer driven or customer driven. It is not like uh, that is why we also started with a user story. How the user will interact with the app. So this is to understand, you know, uh, what kind of interactions the user is going to do. And also you see the way we have written this user story, you can see all our verbs, browse, paginate, view, filter, sort, all these are verbs because verbs directly translates to behavior. So that is what the BDD is all about and it translates to operations within the API definition. So we looked at API endpoints in our example accompanied by HTTP verbs. Post. What is this post operation doing? It is adding a new pet to the store, which is again an action, an operation. Whereas if you look at this pet with an ID, you have get, that is getting the details of a particular pet, posting or updating details or deleting. So all these are operations or actions on a particular endpoint. So uh, the, and the API first approach, you will, not deviate from what your uh, people, uh, what the consumers actually want from your app. That is why in some of the best practices of open API, they say it should be, when you are designing your API, don't think in terms of the data model. Think in terms of how people are going to call your API. What is the user story? What consumers are actually looking for in the API? That will help you design the correct API. Thank you. Any other questions? I hope that gives you some clarity. Um, uh, Naveen, I, I think you had a question. Yeah, yeah I have. Go ahead. Uh, Pop in. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Yeah. 
so uh, where will be write this you will be use visual code or editor or um, uh, somewhere you have to write write these things or yeah, is there any so tool available for that one actually the, yeah it's a good question there is actually no shortage of tools on the web to do this so many tools like for example because this is nothing but yaml and there are plugins for vs code to help you identify problems early when you are writing code itself but if you want to do it online on the cloud you can use this uh, editor from swagger so uh, you okay. can see yeah. here as you write the specifications on the left side on the right side you have a representation of the specs immediately so i'll show you a demo here suppose for example instead of pet i will put pets automatically the documentation on the right side changes can you see it yeah yeah so it has become pets but it is not just documentation i can expand this and i can immediately see what i have defined here all the parameters put and post i have defined the two operations i can see that here yeah if i, I got this yes, sure. you can mm. see here put and post on the pets endpoint yeah it's a swagger uh, inbuilt functionality is there yeah. Uh, yeah so what i'm telling that um, suppose i have uh, done this editor somewhere i need to uh, save as a json or um, uh, yml file or something and how i'll be consumed to that one into my uh, editor what i'm using c sharp or visual studio and this is uh, files yeah yeah so there are a bunch of tools let's go to devopedia article there open api tools i'll open this site so remember open api specification is powerful only because of the tools tools in the ecosystem so there are a lot of auto code generators so from the open api specification you can generate code generation let's say converters documentation so there are so many things data validators auto generators that will take your code and uh, this is something else auto generators there are code generators mock servers sdk generators server implementation let's say you are looking at server implementation now you can see here what is the language so you said c sharp right yeah so there will be a code generator for c sharp it is not listed here but uh, i know that there is a code generator here in this particular site they have listed a lot of generators for node js php typescript python perl and so on but uh, here so many other things but definitely there is a code generator for uh, c sharp as well open api So oh, this one, Open API generator, C sharp, client libraries, server stuff, etc. This may not be the best, but anyway, this is one of the first matches which you have got. It's not bad. Uh, generator C sharp. So this is an example. So you take your YAML or JSON, and then you call it with a particular code generator. and you will get the code both the client code as well as the server code in your language of choice so i need Does to add a i need to add a reference for uh, this server files and this js file into my projects or means on my application or how it will be work or no, somewhere in have a configuration going to the details mm -hmm. but you the input is the yaml or a json then you take your code generator output will be your code which you will commit into your code repo so okay. the input also will be committed into the code repo so when your api specification evolves you can have some sort of a ci cd pipeline which will automatically update your code when your api also evolves no that's that correct only but uh, uh, that's correct only but uh, uh, for testing purpose uh, i need to some configuration somewhere in app.json or somewhere i need to put this uh, uh, file extension or something 
uh, then automatically it will take out that i'll check it and the other thing that the the security maintain suppose authentication and all these things uh, everyone can use this api right so i have uh, a, do some specific security or some authentication how we are going to do in this is it available for this also yeah you can define that uh, so uh, we I, we did not uh, explore that but let's go back here so you can see here uh, we covered co under components we covered only the schemas as an example but along with schemas there is one part called security schemes and in this security schemes, you can define a number of reusable security schemes. It can be a OAuth oh, kind of authentication, or it can be an API key. Yeah. And having defined this here under the components, you can then on a endpoint by endpoint basis, you can say which particular security scheme it is supposed to use. For example, here it says security. It will use pet store auth security which has been defined pet store security is nothing but using OAuth 2 using an implicit flow what we are saying is if you have to do a post you require an OAuth 2 authentication whereas if you have to do a get is there any restriction on get okay method you level also you can uh, yeah every every method level also you can give the authentication you are telling instead of okay. yes yes you can give that yes any further questions so uh, right now uh, right now in the market uh, uh, here uh, this is not just documented go ahead yeah any other questions from others uh, uh, so I'm uh, I'm asking um, in right now who are using the open API in uh, like um, Amazon or uh, Facebook or anyone st uh, are started using this API or um, is recently in market or how it is? No, this is uh, quite old. No, we have seen the history. So uh, everybody is using it, uh, but they may be using. Uh, actually, uh, we don't have exact stats. But uh, some people are stuck with Swagger, so they are not yet migrated. That is the old version. Yes, yeah, Swagger, I am also but, uh, used it. Like a postman, I have used it, Swagger. But. Uh, so that is my answer. I'm sure a lot of people in the industry are using it, but I don't have any uh, facts to back it up. So we, okay. uh, you can Google it. Yeah, you will Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Arvind. Any further questions? Uh, I have only a couple of things to cover. Yeah, Naveen, go ahead. Um, Arvind, I just saw that on uh, the editor, there is an option to generate the uh, server stubs and client stubs, like the editor where you are showing the pet uh, store API. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so, yeah, that can be generate server like it. generate client. Yeah, the thing is, this is all given by Swagger. I am using this only for the editor focus because the UI is nice. But yeah. typically, people don't use the generators here because they, 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 there could be better generators from others, from right. third-party vendors. So that is where you know sites like this become useful because. Uh, they have it's a curate, kind of a curated list of all the different generators out there. And uh, many of this could be open source, whereas because this is a generator from Swagger, it may or may not be open source. And certain uh, features yeah. of these generators may be uh, paid features. So there are certain restrictions to using this, but if this suits your purpose, fine and good. So I will tell you, I am you. Uh, I am dealing with. Uh, I am working in the area of 5G, where some of the 5G specifications are specified using Open API specification. And uh, we don't use the Swagger generator because, firstly, it's paid, and secondly, it has certain limitations. Okay. Okay. But if you take the paid version, those limitations may not be there. That is what I want to point out. 
Right, right. Uh, I believe there are some uh, open source based uh, stub generators also that are open API compatible. So, yeah. uh, like, yeah, yeah, like you said, it depends maybe. on the language. See, some right. generators are very mature, especially for JavaScript, very mature. But uh, let's say C Sharp and .NET, those generators less mature. There are certain things they may not support. So I just wanted to mention that. Sure. Any other questions? So whatever extra things I wanted to cover, you guys have uh, clarified that by during the Q and A. So anything else you want to ask, we can cover that as well. Because we have maybe five ten minutes, we can take. So let's summarize here. So open API uh, at the top level, these are the kind of elements that you have at the top level. So you have something called open API version, then some info about what this API is all about. So here it is giving a title, a description, terms of service, licensing, right? So those kind of details uh, are given here. So let's say you are designing an API and you want to make it, uh, you know, GNU GPL license 3.0, you can change it and give a link to the particular license URL. So those kind of things can be changed according to your requirements. So that is about info about the API. External documents. So let's say you have designed this based on certain specification which is published by let's say IET Ref. Okay. So then you can give this so as a extra link to that particular source. Servers. This is very important. Now uh, you see I told you earlier that not only can you look at the right side as documentation, but you can also call this API. So let's say we take this example pet find by status. I open this. What are the parameters for this? It has only one parameter called and It's a drop. So it can be a status value that needs to be considered for filter. So it can be available and uh, other values are there, painful and so on. So it says try it out. So let's try it out. So then you can do a drop down available pending sold. So let's say available and we execute and we are saying I want the response in JSON. So I execute this. Something happens. And I get the response back. In JSON the way I wanted it back. So this is exactly what is happening here. I made a get request. I got the response back in JSON a list of the pets which are available. Now the question is in this example exactly which URL was queried. How do, see we are only giving the endpoint, but this is not enough, right? When you are calling an API on the web, you need a complete which URL is actually being queried here. So that magic happens through the servers object here. So here under servers, the URL is specified. So this is actually the URL which is called and to this, this path is appended. So you can also check it when you do a inspect because uh, you know Chrome or Chrome is right. Oh, this is very you useful, can go like a uh, mock second. server. Execute. Yeah, yeah. Basically, from the API, there is an implement. And for some reason, responses. But uh, yeah, you can see here exactly the URL which is called. So this we saw in the servers object. 
find by status and uh, I believe we got the response also. So this is the response. It is in JSON format. So this can be used not only for looking at it from a documentation perspective, but you can also use the Swagger editor for quickly testing your APIs. So that is where the server's object comes in. Tags, tags is simple to understand. If you see here, everything is organized under three groups, pet, store, user. So we have a number of endpoints. So we want to organize them in a certain way. So that is where tags comes into play. For every endpoint, you say I put a tag. So to give you an example, paths, pets, put, you can see here. This operation, it's given a tag, pet. Suppose I remove this, what happens? You notice that this put operation has disappeared from here. It has gone down to the bottom under default. So tags is nothing but a way of organizing all your endpoints into groups. That is how I see it. Okay. Then paths, these are all the API endpoints. We have already seen this. Components, very important. This is where you will define all your reusable components, whether it's schemas or request bodies or responses, security schemes. All this will be defined under components and then reused elsewhere. So if we go back to our uh, open uh, Devopedia article, you can see that here. Uh, this is one way of you have an open API object. You have all the endpoints which are under the paths object. For each endpoint, you have a path item object, and each ob item object corresponds to one HTTP method: get, put, post, delete, and so on. Now each one links to an operation object: summary, description, request body, responses, operation ID, and so on. And for each response. You have a HTTP code for 200. What you should do 404. What kind of error message you should give 400. What message you should give and each response object has a description and a content. The content is in many cases optional, but if it's a 200, that means everything is fine. Typically you expect a content. That is the response coming back. So this is how you know the endpoints are organized. So the open API specification is available online. Uh, the link is there on the Devopedia page. The other useful resource is this one. I already showed you the tools. The other useful one is the open API map. So this you can see here, it's a graph. Visually you can view the open API. I can click here, it opens up. I can click paths, it opens up a path object. I can click this, it expands. And now I can get details. What should I, how should I write my get? How should I write my response body? How should I request body? How should I write my responses? Which are the status codes? So visually, if you don't want to read the API specification, which is all textual here, you want to learn it visually, you can use this graph. So this is under this is called open API map. So two ways in which you that can is very interactive about open API.